All right, let's get this show on the road. Hello, everyone. Hope you're well. Welcome to another edition of Math 1203, 1206. Um, let's uh, get this thing started. Okay, so we're going to recap with yesterday, had some technical difficulties. I don't think I posted the video yet. Uh, try to post the lecture for both yesterday and today, tonight at some point, uh, probably late. Um, just, I guess before we recap, we can actually um, mention some announcements. Mm -hmm. So let's start with some announcements. So, uh, final, <laughs> probably the most important one. I, it will make it July, uh, I want to say, second um, to um, let me be a little bit more specific uh, will three point five hour window uh, from uh, July 2nd at 9 a.m. to uh, July 3rd um, when was the date so I want to give you guys as much flexibility as possible, but now I'm forgetting when everything should be in it, if it's the fifth or the sixth. I'm thinking, ask, ah, but I'll, I'll give you guys to the fourth. Um, at, um, Nine a.m. So it's a forty-eight hour window, and it's a uh, uh, Eastern time. Um, so I know some of you are in uh, different time zones. So uh, nine a.m. New York time, July second through nine a.m. New York time, July fourth, um, which afterwards you can enjoy the rest of your 4th of July um, as well as I think um, in a lot of places the 5th of July is also like a, an officially recognized holiday it's like a, uh, when you recognize July 4th a lot, a lot of people don't have work that day so you can d enjoy your 4th and your 5th just not worry about anything um, until then so I think I'll make the final during that window so that's the first thing um, covers every thing we do up to today. Um, so, um, you know, aside from any bonus material. Now, I do actually expect to finish everything that uh, is in our official syllabus today. So um, where we did miss a lecture, so I was going to actually make up a lecture tomorrow, but um, anything I would talk about tomorrow will technically be extra. 
um, that we don't necessarily have to do. So I was thinking maybe you guys might would would rather like a review session or something. Would that be something you guys are interested in? Because I could do that. Like instead of just forging ahead with new material that technically you won't really need to know until like the beginning of Calc 2, um, I could instead just hold like a review session. Um, do you guys think that would be good or for those of you who are here? Um, what do you guys think? Afon, were you going to say something? No, I was going to say that I wouldn't mind like learning new material because like I could review on my own time. And since we have like so much time since the test, like I could do it on my own time. I would okay, like so, to learn material. So I'll like, I'll do some extra. I might just reemphasize some things that we did today as well, but uh, I might do some extra material. Um, uh, maybe some light review. So I haven't finalized the final as yet, but I, I have kind of the skeleton of it. Maybe I'll just also talk about some of that as well. Just like, okay, here, a heads up, here's what you should expect. But for the most part, the final is going to be sort of like test one and test two combined, plus the materials that we've covered the two days prior to test one, test two. So in terms of like um, the level of difficulty, like how the questions would be expressed, that sort of thing, you can pretty much expect more of the same. It shouldn't be like, oh, I've never seen a test like this. Like that's not, it's not how it's going to be. Um, so, and this, you, you, you actually, um, uh, I will record during class time, uh, but uh, joining is, is optional. So you can consider this like an asynchronous thing if you want. Um, but if you want to like make any comments or anything, you can uh, join. So I'll use the same link during the same time, kind of re record an extra lecture. Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Now, uh, to recap, last time we learned to do, last time we learned a lot of theory and a lot of background. And um, we're going to learn a little bit more of that today, except I'm not really gonna prove anything, but I'm going to talk about some concepts that I want you guys to know about applications of uh, integration. And I'm going to teach you a new integration technique. So we saw the basic rules of integration last time. We also spoke about, I, I remind you of some definitions, but we also spoke about one application uh, to the physics of motion about how we can go from position to velocity to acceleration using differentiation. We can actually go in the opposite direction using anti-differentiation or integration. Uh, we did an example of that. I then went through a very long discussion to justify uh, the fundamental theorem of calculus and very, very important theorem. It also helps us to compute definite integrals and the point of computing definite integrals is to find area under curves. The point of finding area under curves is to help us find the area of these oddly uh, shaped things. It also shows us how to differentiate integral functions, functions that are defined in terms of the area under some other curve. Uh, how would you find the derivative of such a function? And pretty much it says that the derivative and the integral, they're kind of inverse operations of each other. Um, they will, one will kind of cancel each other out. And in this scenario, uh, because you're doing this kind of calculation, you actually cancel out the plus C term from here, so you won't have it. Um, but remember, technically, there should be a plus C there when you're taking an antiderivative. Um, so it's not an exact inverse. There can be stuff missing when you take an integral to try to recover what a derivative destroyed. Um, but with ex some extra information, you can uh, recover everything. And yeah, afterwards, we did a bunch of examples computing definite integrals. Uh, and we did a bunch of examples computing the derivative of functions that are defined as integrals. All the while doing it, I was telling you about some properties, which I'll probably mention a few more uh, today. I think I'll, I'll do that actually now. 
uh, and some helpful little facts that can help you get through things a little easier. So I think that's where I want to start today, um, just with uh, uh, is to start with just talking about Uh, Technology is not really agreeing with me today. Okay. So I want to talk about, continue with some uh, properties of integrals. Um, so let um, f of x, uh, g of x, be uh, integrable functions. Uh, um, let uh, C little m big M um, A B be constants, then the following properties hold. For one, and I mean, you can sort of figure this out uh, just by doing computation, but this is going to be equal to that. Um, and that's pretty much just showing that if you have a constant function C, um, between A and B, uh, the length here is going to be B minus A and the height here is going to be C. And so that actually just gets you the area of the rectangle. Um, so that's not actually bad. You could actually figure that out by just directly doing that computation. The antiderivative of C is going to be C times X, then the fundamental theorem of calculus says you're gonna plug in the B minus plug in the A. All right, so we have that. Secondly, um, I also want you to, well, this is not, uh, Since we're on the subject of errors, I also want you to recall that um, the integral from a to b of f of x dx represents the uh, area under f of x on a, b which is equal to the net area um, under f of x on AB. So I, I just want you to remember that if we have, say, a function that looks like this, say this is A, this is B, uh, you have an area over here, call it A1, that's an area. And you have an area down here, call that A2. And that's an area. And this can be uh, a point C here. Then um, then the integral from A to B of f of x dx is going to be the integral from A to C of f of x dx. Um, plus the integral from uh, c to b of f of x dx. And this is going to give you the first area. And it's actually going to be subtracting the last area. So if something is underneath the uh, x-axis, um, then our Riemann sums would be rectangles with negative height. And so we'll get a negative area. And the integral will actually subtract all the negative areas and add all the positive areas. 
which means if you actually wanted an area enclosed by something, you have to be aware that, oh, I need to manually change the sign of anything that is um, underneath the x-axis. So um, every, as, every, every time I'm talking about integrals, I just want that to be in the background of your mind. Uh, that's going to be important. So um, another thing, dos. Okay, so the second property is going to be that uh, we can factor constants out. You should know that. So the integral from a to b of c times f of x dx is equal to c times integral from a to b of f of x dx. Third, integrals distribute across sums. Um, some other properties, uh, the integral um, if your f of x is always greater than or equal to zero, which means it's always a positive function, then your integral will always be greater than or equal to zero. Um, another thing you should know about integration in terms of uh, arithmetic is that integrals obey inequalities. So if f of x is always greater than or equal to g of x on a, b, um, then um, the integral from a to b of f of x dx is always going to be greater than or equal to the integral from a to b of g of x dx. So if you have an inequality and you take integrals on all sides on the same interval, uh, the inequality maintains uh, its direction. Um, another thing is uh, if we suppose um, that our function is actually in between some values that it's always greater than or equal to some value m, but always less than or equal to some value big M on AB. Then um, the integral and again you can actually do this by direct computation is equal to that. Um, then that will be maintained. So, um, yeah. So I gave you guys some other properties, but that's just uh, some things that you can just know to do calculations easier. It's not, uh, they weren't actually stated as official properties in your textbook, believe it or not. So I'm going to, I, I, I sort of gave you guys those as some extra, which I think is nice. Okay, so now what I want to do is, I think there's something running in the background, which is why everything is kind of messing up here. I'm pretty sure after this, I just wanted to jump into substitution. Um, 4.5. Yeah, so the main things I wanted to do today were substitution, integration by substitution, and um, just some applications of integration.
All right, so now we are going to do that. Um, now, uh, let us learn another integration technique. So this leads us into section 4.5 uh, and it's called uh, integration by substitution. Essentially what this is, uh, the idea is the following. We learned a lot about derivatives and we learned about product rule, quotient rule, chain rule, all this other stuff. And it turns out that uh, integrals kind of have equivalents, uh, equivalent things to that. And so integration by substitution is actually the equivalent of the chain rule. So what this is, it's uh, the reverse of the chain rule. And so this will allow us to actually do more complicated integration, uh, integrals of composite functions um, that obey kind of like the chain rule. So it's really the reverse of the chain rule. Uh, so you do have to have some conditions actually fulfilled here. So recall, uh, recall the chain rule. Um, we know that the derivative of f of g of x um, is equal to um, f prime of g of x times g prime of x, okay? So uh, the fundamental theorem of calculus would tell us um, that if I were to take the integral of this guy, that um, this would actually be equal to f of g of x plus c. Um, now, now we can uh, do a change of notation here. Uh, if we set u equals to g of x, And so this would mean that du dx is equal to g, g prime, or in other words, uh, our du is equal to g prime of x dx. Then if we have the antiderivative of f prime of g of x uh, times g prime of x dx, that should be a g prime. Then this part here is du, and this part here is u. And so really this can transform itself into f prime of u du. And then we know that the, uh, and the, the integral of the derivative is just going to give you back the original function uh, plus c, and uh, which case that's just your f of this. So substitution, um, this is what we call a substitution. Um, so we substitute u for g of x. Uh, to obtain an integral like that guy, um, which is often going to be easier to deal with uh, than the other, uh, than the original. Um, the upshot is uh, the integral
Now, I'm going to explain to you what the right conditions are, but you can kind of even see it from here. Notice that we have to have something that looks like this, as well as the derivative of what something that's inside looks like in order for us to transform it to that. So there are going to be scenarios in which you can figure out that that happens, okay? So, so um, ultimately, Uh, in calculus two, um, you will learn uh, a general approach a general approach is kind of I don't want to give the impression that it's like, oh yeah, this is a general approach. You can always do this and you'll be fine. That's not true. As I mentioned last class, antiderivatives are actually very difficult to compute in general. And there are a lot where we just, we don't know how to do it. So just, just for what it's worth, a general approach to compute any integral is just means that a general approach to compute any integral that you would see at that level. That's what I mean. Um, to computing uh, integrals. Uh, so say f of x dx. Uh, but the first few steps would be uh, the steps would be uh, step one. Uh, try to apply a basic rule. Uh, these were um, at the beginning of yesterday's notes. So by applying a basic rule, I basically mean, I basically mean uh, applying one of these guys here. So sometimes the thing you're looking at just looks exactly like one of these rules. You can fit, you remember we have the idea that our rules are like templates, they should fit right over our problem. And anytime any guys, uh, any problem that you're looking at fits with one of these guys very cleanly, right? So your K in this uh, example is a constant. So it could be the integral of five dx. What is that going to be equal to? I'm talking about rule one at the moment. Uh, well, so if I have the integral of five dx, well, that's just, going to be 5x plus c, right? So I can, it, it'll look like exactly like one of these rules. So that would be the first thing you, that you would try to do. Um, the second thing that you would try to do, uh, step two, is you would try to simplify so that you can apply a basic rule. So this should remind you of uh, what we did with limits, uh, where we said, oh, just try to plug in a number. And if that doesn't work, try to simplify so you can plug in a number. Very reminiscent of that. And I think we did some examples of this, like this yesterday as well. Um, let me show you an example of what I mean. Yeah, so something like G from yesterday. how I was given this integral, but it didn't really look like a basic rule. So what I did was the second step, I were divided the radical x into each part. And so now it looks like the power rule, right? It looks like x to the n, x to the n, right? So it didn't look like that in the beginning. Um, it looked like this, x minus three all over radical x, but that wasn't very useful. Didn't look like a rule. So what I could do is I could simplify it so it looks like a rule. And now I can apply the rule, add one to the power divided by the new power. Right, so that's what I mean by this second step here. Now, of course, the third step, step three, is try substitution. And um, it's always going to be like the third step. Uh, so it's one of those things where in Calc 2, you're going to learn a bunch of uh, new integration techniques and you're going to learn how to integrate all 
sorts of things in a variety of ways. All right. So you're going to learn a bunch of techniques. And it turns out that one of the challenges is going to be recognizing when to apply which technique to which integral, right? Sort of like how with limits, I tell you a bunch of techniques with limits. And eventually the hardest part was just recognizing, well, what technique do I try on this random limit? And that's why I gave you the steps to do limits. Um, the same thing is going to, you're going to have the same feel with integrals. There's going to be a bunch of techniques and you're going to want to know, well, what do I do first or second or third? And this is, this is pretty much it. This is always the first three steps for any integral, just like how with limits, the first three steps is always try to plug in, try to simplify if you can plug in, right? Though those are always the first two things you try to do with a random limit. Um, in the same way, if you have a random integral that you want to compute, these are the first three things that you would do. Um, and then step, uh, step four and onwards. Uh, well, that's, that's Calc 2. Um, so uh, what, you, what you are expected to know as a Calc 1 student is this. Uh, so Calc 1 students. So when you go into a Calc 2 class, uh, your instructor is going to expect you to know already what an integral is, what it means, what it finds, how to do integrate basic functions up to uh, the level of using a substitution. So that will be expected of you, right? So that's what I'm going to actually tell you how to do now. So, so just so you know, as a general rule, this will apply to uh, your final as well, right? So if I give you a bunch of integrals, just like how I gave you a bunch of derivatives, like part A, B, C, D, I'm gonna say, oh, compute the following integrals. And your goal is going to be, well, how do I compute these guys? What method do I use? What rule do I apply? You're always going to think these three steps in this order. Does it look exactly like a basic rule? Can I just do it? Then do it. Uh, can I simplify it so it looks like a basic rule? And if so, yeah, then do that. If not, the next thing you would think, oh, it must be a substitution. And that's going to be the answer in a Calc, two, in a calc 1 class because there's no other technique that you would officially know at this point. So if the first two steps don't work, it's step three. There must be a way to do a substitution there. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so let's go, let's go into step three. Uh, now, suppose uh, substitution is the appropriate method. Uh, how do we do it? So now I'm going to describe to you the method of integration by substitution. All right, so um, given the integral of f of x dx, um, suppose steps one or two do not work. Then uh, one, here's what you're going to do. You're going to look at the integral and you're going to try to figure out, well, what is the thing that's making this integral complicated? Why does it not look like a basic rule? Try to figure that out. So that's the first thing. This is usually going to be you trying to identify the inside function, the g of x. That's usually what's going to mess things up. So you are going to replace a complicating expression um, in the integrand with a single variable. Now, uh, 
typically this is you, or I should say uh, traditionally. Uh, with the variable u. This is so common that there are a lot of students who call this u substitution, which is, it's incorrect. You shouldn't do that. It's substitution. You don't have to substitute u. You can substitute any letter you want, but u is just the generic one that we always use. It's kind of like when we say, oh, y equals f of x is how you define a function. Well, your variable doesn't always have to be x, right? And the function doesn't have to always be named f and you don't always have to use Y. Those are just some generic stuff that we started out with and it just became tradition to use those. So you can use U, but uh, you should know that there's another method in Calc 2 that you're going to learn that also uses the variable U. And so if you have to use both methods simultaneously, you probably don't want to use U for the substitution. Use another variable like T instead or something. Um, so uh, yeah. Now, um, There, there are two criteria uh, needed to make a good substitution. So uh, Roman numeral one, okay? So you have this situation where you have this um, uh, integral that you can't do with a basic rule. You can't simplify it to look like a basic rule. So you know you have to do substitution. So now the question is going to be, well, since I have to replace some expression with a variable, what do I replace? How do I choose what to do properly, right? Which is a little bit nuanced, but I should, uh, I'm gonna to try to distill it for you, right? So uh, the substitution should make the integrand simpler, i.e., what does it mean simpler, right? <laughs> Look like a basic rule. That's what it means. Like at the end of the day, once you do the substitution, what you're looking at should look more like a basic rule, far more like a basic rule than it did before. If it doesn't, or it just gets more complicated, you made the wrong substitution. It's essentially, that's the thing. Um, second criteria, uh, the derivative of what you substitute should be present as a factor um, in the integrand. Um, there's a very uh, important note I would say here um, you may ignore uh, constant factors. Um, as well as um, as well as if the a derivative self is a constant. It is fine if you don't see it. Um, I'd also put a, a second note. Um, In calc two, uh, we don't necessarily 
need this uh, right away since we will have ways of putting the derivative in if not present. So this is a very, uh, it's a good strategy for calc one because usually the thing that you substitute, you'll be able to see its derivative somewhere else uh, very easily. Just ignore any constant factor parts. Um, but in general, technically this is not needed. There are going to be times where that's not the case that you won't be able to see the derivative, but a substitution can still work. So that's why step three, try substitution. You should always try substitution. Even if at face value, it doesn't seem like it might work. Uh, a lot of times trying it, you'd be surprised. It'll work out in situations where it's not even obvious. Um, so in other words, like uh, uh, criteria two, criteria two working out might not be obvious. especially in calc two and above, just so you know. So um, that's it. In general, uh, the, the main thing is to replace an expression in your integral that makes it look simpler. Um, in calc one, you will very usually, 99.9% .9 of the time, you'll be able to see the derivative of that thing you picked as a factor somewhere else in the integrand except it might be off by a constant factor, that's that's fine. So you might, your derivative might be two times some function, but in the integrand, you only see the function, it's fine. The two times doesn't matter. You can always factor out a half or something. Um, so yeah, uh, two. Okay, so the first thing is going to be to make the substitution. Uh, and this is how you know you're making a good one. The second thing you're going to do is you're going to plug in your U and your DU. Um, notice I said DU here, you must replace dx because you're you're changing the variable right um, making a substitution is changing the independent variable Um, no instance of the independent variable, of the original independent variable, should be present after your substitution. There are a lot of side notes here. There are a lot of things that you have to look for um, that it's, uh, yeah, I, I have to describe it all in words. Okay, so um, the third thing, you will now get it, once you do this, uh, you will now have a simpler integral. in a new variable 
compute this integral. So you will obtain an integral where now you can apply a basic rule or now you can see clearly how you need to maneuver um, to actually do it. So you just, you do it. Um, or you will back substitute to get your answer um, in the original variable. in terms of the original variable. Okay. Um, so you can have an integral f of x dx. So your independent variable is x. You do a substitution. Let's say you use the variable u. So now you get a new integral where the variable is u. You're going to do that integration. You're going to get an answer, but you'll have the variable u in it. So what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to swap the u's out back for whatever expression in x it was. So now your answer is in terms of the x, right? That's, that's basically what a back substitution is. You're going to re-undo the original substitution. Now, um, I would say for part b, um, step four is not strictly necessary in the event you are computing a definite integral. And um, And there are cases where you want to avoid um, step four when doing definite integrals such as when doing a, I'm gonna pop up here, a what's called a trig substitution. In Calc 2. So, um, Step four would be for us always an optional thing, but in Calc 2, you're gonna learn a bunch of different methods. And some of them are going to be very elaborate, let's say. And the act of doing the back substitution can itself be a whole other process that you just might want to avoid. And so trig substitution is such a thing. You're going to learn a, 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 a method called trig substitution in Calc 2, where it's like to do the back substitution, get the original variable, you have to do a bunch of a, a lot of calculations sometimes in terms of trig. So you have to do some Sokotoa stuff and, and rewrite your trig functions and blah, blah, blah. You have to go through a whole other process just to get back to the original variable. Um, you might not want to do that. You can literally take double the time to make these extra calculations. And so I'd say avoid them. Uh, I'll show you how to avoid. Um, um, I will show you how to avoid back substitution. When doing definite integrals later. Um, okay. Let's do a, a quick example. 
So you kind of see what I'm talking about and when you might want to use uh, something like this. So let's say uh, I had this integral to compute. Um, 5x times the square root of 1 plus x squared dx. Okay. So um, that's the guy I want to do, right? So let's see how we would do that. So first, note, uh, does not look like a basic rule. Right, you don't have a rule in the, the 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 guide that I gave you yesterday that looks like some polynomial times a radical function, right? Um, second thing, uh, can't simplify to look like a basic rule. Right. How are you going to simplify this? You can't do anything, right? Remember, radicals do not distribute across sums. We knew that since day zero. All right, so it's not like you can distribute the radical and then multiply out the 5x. You can't, right? And to rewrite the radical of 1 plus x squared as an expression where you can multiply out, you would need an infinite number of terms, also some that you would learn in Calc 2. So yeah, not it's not going to be an option, right? You can't simplify this. Um, and so now you decide... Substitution or try substitution. Now, once you decide to try substitution, you're going to decide what to substitute. So now when you decide that, remember, what is your goal? You want to make one, the integral simpler, and two, you want to see, do can I find the derivative of whatever thing I swap out to make it simpler elsewhere in the integral? So the first thing you're going to notice is, what is actually making this complicated? Um, note, the one plus x squared is what makes it complicated. Why does the 1 plus x squared makes it complicated? Because notice that if, if we had, if we had, say, you know, 5x times the radical of x, that's not a problem. That would be just like a 5x to the 3 halves, right? Easy, right? So that's, that's not an issue. The reason we cannot simplify is because there's a sum under the radical. Having the sum under the radical makes it complicated. I can't expand stuff. I can't do any algebra that would make it easy, right? So the fact that the, the sum under the radical is the issue. So that would lead you to say, let u be 1 plus x squared. I am going to replace the sum under the radical, the 1 plus x squared, with the u. Right? Now, remember, immediately we need to find du, which is going to be 2x dx. Right? So. Um, Maybe I should put this. So for the integral of 5x times the radical of 1 plus x squared dx, I realize that that's the issue, so that leads me here. Now that I do this thing, I would notice that this part here is actually in the integral here. Notice that the thing that the derivative of the thing, the derivative of the substitution is a factor in the 
integrand if we ignore the two, which we do ignore our constant factors, right? So that tells you good substitution. Right? So that's going to indicate, you're going to look at this, you're going to like, what makes this complicated? Well, that one plus x squared is super annoying because it was just one thing under the radical. I would just raise it to the half power and multiply stuff out. All right, so then you decide, all right, maybe I should do uh, u equals one plus x squared. Hang on. Maybe I should do u equals one plus x squared. And so now you might want to say, well, is that the right thing? Well, if you do the derivative of it, and then you realize that, oh, that's actually a factor in the original integral, then that is actually a point in your favor. It means it's easy to swap it out. Now, um, there are multiple ways to proceed at this point, but most students find it easy to do what I'm going to do. Uh, so, multiple ways to proceed. But students tend to find solving for dx and plugging uh, everything in easier. So, uh, Afterwards, uh, what you would notice is that your dx is going to be du over 2x, right? So what you're going to do is you're going to plug into the original integral. Uh, you're going to have your 5x times the radical of 1 plus x squared times dx. Uh, and you realize here that your dx is going to be du over 2x. You also realize that your 1 plus x squared is actually just u. You're just going to plug these guys in. So the integral is going to become 5x times the radical of u times du over 2x. Now, what's that going to do? Your x's will cancel. And you can factor out the 5 over 2 by the integral property. And that's your new integral. Which is really nice. Um, that's actually something that we can do a, 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 basic, a basic rule on. Um, and so from here, This integral is easier to deal with, so do so. Um, now, if you have this integral of 5 over 2 times the radical of u du, you can realize that, hey, I can write that as uh, u to the 1 half. And the power rule applies. I would add 1 to the power divide by the new power plus C. And so this is going to be um, five over two. Uh, it's going to be U to the three halves times two thirds. So then you'd have five over three U to the three halves. And that's, that's actually the answer. Um, this is the answer. However, it's in U. To put it back into X, you would do a back substitution. This is what's called back substitution. So to get the answer in X, uh, use U equals 1 plus X squared, and you plug that in. So this is, this is what we call back substitution.
So I'm literally going to go here and in place of you, I'm going to plug in the original expression that I used you to replace. And that, and that is my answer. And you can check that if we differentiate this, you would get the original back. So of course it's not going to take this long. I'm just really writing everything down that can that would come to mind that you're doing. So you see this, you're like, that's not a basic rule. Can't simplify it to be a basic rule. Let's do a substitution. What do I substitute? The thing that makes it complicated. What makes it complicated? The one plus x squared. Boom. U equals one plus x squared. What's the du? You do the derivative. Oh, that's neat. I have an x dx, and the original has an x dx. So it's a good substitution. Boom, solve for the dx, plug in the u and the du. At the end of the day, you'll get an easier integral. This integral should be one where you can apply a basic rule to. So you just do that and you get an answer. Your answer though is going to be in terms of this new variable u. No bueno. So what do you do? You back substitute. Whatever your original substitution was, just replace the variable, the new variable with that expression and you will now have your answer in x's. And that will be the antiderivative. Um, there's an alternative to this part. Um, Uh, it's, it doesn't get you anywhere different. It's just that conceptually, some students prefer this way, but there are other ways to think about it. Um, so you would have this equation, this integral. You go u equals 1 plus x squared. Your du is equal to 2x dx. What a lot of students will do is that they would just uh, divide by the 2. and then actually just replace the x dx. So now the new integral becomes five radical u times uh, one half du, which is your x dx. And then your u, which is this guy, is replaced here. So you're substituting, you're literally swapping things out. That's what's happening. Um, so some students like solving for dx and just replacing the dx and canceling the x's manually. Some students just literally swap out the x and dx simultaneously and just replace it with a constant times du. And they both get you to the same place, right? They both get you to the fact that you can factor out the five and the one half and end up here, right? So you still end up in the same place. It's just uh, the conceptual uh, manipulation is slightly different, um, but they're both they're both fine. Uh, do whichever way you prefer, whichever way you like. Um, so, and that would be substitution. I will give you uh, another slight uh, variation on this. Not necessary. but can make uh, more complicated integrals easier to handle. Um, 
and that is uh, modifying the substitution. Um, going to repeat, this is not necessary, completely optional. And uh, I probably want to mention something like that <laughs> anyway. So um, I see this happened all the time and it, it's just, it really shouldn't be something that happens. So uh, I'm just going to say it uh, because it, it's really weird to me that it even happens in the beginning. You'll learn something in class, right? The teacher does something one method and you're like, oh yeah, I get it, I'm good. And then the teacher would go, all right, here's an alternative method. And then you'll he'll do it. And then you'll be like, uh, that confuses me. And then suddenly you become confused about the whole topic. Like, oh, I don't know, this method, that method. Choose the method that you understand ignore everything else. There's literally no reason to know it. If you, like I'm giving you an alternative method. If the alternative doesn't jive with you, like I just gave you, oh, you can do this or you can do that. You can do with this or you can do with that, right? If you don't understand one of these methods, don't do it. Just ignore it, forget it. Do the method that you, you know, right? So whenever I'm teaching you different variations on something, if you only understand one of the ways, do that. Don't, don't make it complicated, right? It's not like I say you have to do anything this way. I'm just teaching you several ways that you could think about this thing. When you go and you do your homework or you're, you're practicing for a test, do it one way all the time if you want. <laughs> I just wanna give you guys options um, that there are several ways you can work through this. Now we are going to work through a bunch of problems where I'm not doing, oh, you can do this or that or this or that and a bunch of ways. I'm gonna just do it straight one way. So you'll get a feel for it. But at the moment, I just want to give you multiple options on how you can think about things. So you do have an option to simplify things even further. Uh, so what do I mean by that? So for example, back to this integral, five uh, X times the radical of one plus X squared. Right? Um, here's one thing you can notice. Yes, the one plus X squared under the radical makes things complicated, but you can also realize, well, Radicals themselves are complicated in general. So like, I, I don't want to have to deal with one. So what you can do is you can actually put in a square on your substitution to kill the radical altogether. So you can say, let, let u squared equals the one plus x squared. So you can put a square under your radical to kill the radical and get rid of it completely, right? And again, not necessary. Like if that confuses you, just ignore everything I'm saying right now. So how would you proceed in that situation? Well, you would differentiate your substitution as usual. So you're going to go through, what is the derivative of this? Well, 2u du equals 2x dx. Okay, done. Um, of course, you can divide both sides by two if you wanted. So essentially your uh, u du is going to be your x dx. And so now you substitute. So where I saw the x dx, this is now u du. And where I saw this guy, this is now u squared. Now the u squared, radical of u squared is just going to be u, the square is going to kill the radical. So now by swapping these out, what I end up with is the five that was there. And instead of x dx, I now have u du. And instead of the here, I now have radical of u squared. So of course that's going to cancel. And now what I have is the integral of five u squared or five times the integral of u squared. Now, um, u squared is easier to deal with than u to the half, right? Like u to the half, you're, you have these fractions, then now you have to add fractions and divide by fractions and da, 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 right? 
in this particular example, it's not that annoying, but there can be examples where just having to deal with the radical and have all these fractions all over the place is annoying. Uh, so what you can do is you can actually have your substitution itself do some of the heavy lifting for you. And you can actually use your substitution to kill like a radical or to kill a cube, a, a cube root or, or to, to do something else. So now uh, to apply the power rule and finish this up, it's, it's actually easier. It's just u cubed over three. And then once again, so now you have five over three u cubed. Now, what is that? Now you can replace it here. This uh, u squared basically just means my u is the radical of one plus x squared. And so I'm going to just move that down here. So this would give me the five over three, one plus x squared to the half power. Um, Let me do this a little differently. This means that your u is equal to the radical of one plus x squared, which is just one plus x squared to the one half. So I just go to the answer and I replace u with one plus x squared to the one half. So I can do my substitution in such a way that it, it simplifies the integrand even further than it would have normally, right? So if I don't like dealing with radicals and I don't like adding halves, adding one to a half or adding one to like a fifth root or something, like I don't have to, right? So if this were a fifth root, uh, five X times the fifth root of one plus X squared, I could do U to the fifth power equals one plus X squared and continue. you know, as an example. Um, yeah, so that's me going through a, a quick example. It should, shouldn't really be a quick example. It should probably be illustrative example. <laughs> um, so I kind of just wanted to walk you through what these pieces mean before I actually do uh, give you a bunch of uh, examples. So we're, we're going to do tons of examples here, but I just want you to understand the process, what you should be thinking about while you're going through the process and some variations on the process that might make cut some corn, allow you to cut some corners on calculations. Um, yeah, so, but in general, the process overall is the following. You see something, it looks complicated. You see an integral, what do you try to do? Apply a basic rule. Oh, can't. Try to simplify to play, ba apply a basic rule. Can't. Next thing you think, substitution. What do you substitute? What makes it complicated? The guy under the radical makes it complicated. So u equals the guy under the radical or u squared equals the guy under the radical. Do whichever one you want. Um, once you say your u, you find the du, you find the derivative. And a good check is to see that the non, the, the variable part of the derivative, ignoring any constant multipliers, is elsewhere in the function. Um, as I mentioned in Calc 2, this is not always going to be obvious. There are going to be times when a substitution can work, even though you don't see it in the function. Um, but in Calc 1, this is 99.9% .9 of the time, you're going to be able to see the derivative of the thing in the function. If your derivative is a constant, you might not see it, it's still okay. Um, and we'll talk about that. So once you do that, you can solve for dx or you can solve for the variable times dx. And the idea is you're going to substitute that in. You'll get a new integral in the new variable. It should be a lot easier. If the new integral you get isn't easier, um, then what was the point of your substitution? Like it, you, it doesn't help. Um, then you just do that integral back substitute and you have the answer. Now in general, if you have a definite integral, meaning numbers on the integral sign, you don't have to do this step, 
but I'll show you that uh, options there when we get to such an example. Okay, um, any questions on that, on this process, on substitution? Anything that you don't really get? Are we good? Um, I can show you another. Uh, a slightly harder variation. So it's kind of like one of those where you don't see the derivative elsewhere in the function right away, but it's it can still work. Uh, something like this. Um, so something like this, what you can do is I could say u squared equals one plus x squared. And so my two u du is equal to two x dx. So this implies u du is equal to x dx. But now you look, you see the x dx and you're like, huh? But it does work. Uh, what you can realize is that the x cubed can be thought of as x squared times x. So it's OK, right? And uh, so what you would do then is you can now substitute. So you have five X squared times your U times the radical, uh, I'm getting rid of the radical, times U uh, DU. And then this X squared here, from this you can know that X squared is just uh, one minus U squared, uh, U squared minus one. And so you can actually replace the remaining guy. And so your integral can become five times u squared minus one times u squared du. Still a lot easier uh, because this is five times u to the fourth minus u squared. And you can do the power rule. So it's u to the fifth over five minus u cubed over three plus c. And your u was actually um, the radical of one plus x squared. So this is going to be five times one plus x squared to the five halves over five minus one plus x squared to the three halves over three. And that would be your derivative, your antiderivative. And you could have done just a u here, but it would be more annoying when you get to here because you'd, you'd have a radical to deal with. Um, but so this is one of the situations in which uh, your derivative might be hidden in the function somewhere where you can realize, oh, that u cubed, I could just think of it as a u squared times the. Uh, that x cubed, I could think of it as x squared times x. That x allows me to swap out the dx part. The leftover x squared, I can just change with my substitution. Um, so yeah, you have little things like that. Um, you shouldn't see too many problems like that in Calc 1, though. Um, but yeah. So that's essentially uh, substitution. So what? Uh, we're going to do now. So we're going to take a break. Uh, you can review uh, what I mentioned here with substitution by going to the link for the notes. And um, after the break, we're just going to kill a bunch of examples and then talk about uh, applications at the end.
Um, yeah, I think I think that's what we will do. So we'll take a 10 minute break. Now we'll see you guys back here and we'll do some examples where we have to do substitution. So yeah, I'll see you guys in a bit. start in eight minutes. show will start in seven minutes. start in six minutes.
show will start in five minutes. start in four minutes. The show will start in two minutes. will start in one minute.
now, on with the show. All right, uh, we're back. Let's, uh, let's get back to the problems. Okay, cool. So now that we know substitution, all of uh, 10 minutes, let's actually do some examples. So I have some examples here that we're gonna go through. You'll notice that they all look um, a lot more complicated than the integrals that we competed yesterday, but we're gonna do all of these guys. Um, so let's, uh, let's do that. So here is the first one. Okay, um, so first thing, doesn't look like a basic rule, can't simplify it to look like a basic rule, so um, you know it's going to be substitution, right? Um, what do you think we should substitute here? Oh, by the way, I probably should mention this at some point. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't exactly know if it, it would be obvious or not. Um, I want you to note. Um, U equals X is always a bad substitution. It, it, it changes nothing. You, like the exact integral that you had before, you'll have the exact same integral after, you just literally just change all the variables. Um, U equals KX, where K is a constant. Um, K is not equal to one and it's not equal to zero, may be a good substitution. But as U equals X straight up, uh, it's never a good substitution. Okay, so let's jump into that. You see something like this, what would you substitute? The X squared. The x squared, right? So you realize that this is sine of x squared. You know how to do with sine of x. The sine of x squared is complicated, right? Complicated means, remember, for us, complicated has a specific meaning. It does not look like a basic rule. If I don't have a basic rule for it, it's complicated. Okay, so yeah, u equals x squared, which means your du would be 2x dx. And so now, Tons of ways we can proceed here. Um, we could say, well, that means one half du is equal to your x dx, and you can swap that out. Um, or uh, maybe I should do. I don't know. Is, is there a preference? I could solve for dx and then plug everything in. So I have x sine u and my dx is replaced by du over 2x. x is cancel. And so I can bring the half out. So now you realize that, hey, that now looks like a basic rule. That looks just like the integral of sine x dx, which I know what the integral of sine x is. minus cosine. 
so now what I can do is do the back substitution. And that's our answer. So that, that is what a fully worked out problem would look like. Um, any questions on this? Are we? Yeah, that was the, the way to go. What about this one? What would your U look like? What would the U be? It's not a basic rule. That you can't simplify it to be a basic rule. What do you do for the U? Would it be the X cubed plus one? The X cubed plus one, right? Um, if you said the X squared, you'd realize that yes, while the derivative is somewhere else in the function, it's not actually going to simplify anything because then this part under, uh, because then this part under here would be an issue. What are you going to replace X squared with? It's going to be U to, the radical is going to stay, you're going to have U to like two thirds or something. Um, it would make it simpler. So here, u equals the x cubed plus one. So your du is going to be three x squared dx. This means you can solve for dx, you're going to get du over three x squared. This means you can go and you can plug in. So you have that two x squared, you didn't do anything with it. The u replaces that, the dx becomes du over three x squared. Your x squares cancel. Two thirds is a constant you can factor out. So now you have that integral. We know how to deal with that integral. It's just uh, u to the one half. So it's u to the three halves times two thirds plus c. And then you back substitute. So it's four over nine uh, x cubed plus one to the three halves plus c. And that would be that one. Notice it's, a, it's the same process all the time. You figure out what's complicated. U equals that thing. Hopefully the derivative is something that you can now swap out to get a different integral with notice that there are no X's in this new integral that I'm getting, um, but it's a lot easier than the original integral, right? So this guy is really like some constant times F prime of G of X times G prime of X. And this is the version of the integral that is like f prime of u, right? So that's that's what I meant way up here when I was talking about this might be, right? It's like we had this and I transformed it into this. And that second integral is a, a much easier, nicer form to deal with because it's now obvious that, oh, there's a basic rule that I can use to deal with that. Um, What about this guy? What do you substitute? Take a guess. Like off one, what would you do here? I would substitute the four minus x. Yeah, because it would just, if that thing was just one variable, like a radical x, it wouldn't be a problem. You just bring it up, make it x to the minus one half. It's not an issue. But because there's a sum there, it's kind of weird. So your u would be four minus x. So your du would be uh, minus one dx, which is just a constant. Now remember, constant factors and constants, we don't really panic over them. 
this just means that um, minus du is equal to dx. So I go over here, it's the radical one u and my dx is minus one du. You can always just divide out the constant. So this just minus the integral of u to the minus one half. And so that is minus uh, add one to the power, divide by the new power plus C. So it's minus two times four minus X to the one half plus C. And you can check if you were to differentiate that, you'd get back the original integrand. By the way, this is, um, it's actually very good practice to be able to recognize what a good substitution would be all on its own. So let's say you're doing homework and you're practicing problems and you computed a bunch of integrals, right? So you did your homework, you did some practice and like, man, I computed like 25 integrals in the past hour. I'm, I'm really tired of just doing this. And you know that once you see the substitution, you can actually get through the integral, your algebra skills are on point, everything is good. Then it turns out you can have additional practice without having to go through all the work by simply just looking through a bunch of problems and identifying, oh, I would do this substitution, this substitution, this substitution. And you can actually get away with just doing that mentally. And it would be as if you practiced all those problems, right? That is of course, assuming that you did a bunch of integrals, you got them all right, and you know that mechanically you can actually get through a problem. Once you see the strategy, you know you have the math skills to execute it. Once you're at that level, you can actually mentally do some practice. And with that, you can actually get through a lot more problems in a very short amount of time. So if you don't have to actually go through and write everything out, it'll take you a few seconds to, to get through a problem mentally because you just know, oh, I would just do this substitution. I can see what would swap out. We're good, you move on. You can do like literally like hundreds of problems in a very short period of time by doing that. Um, and it's actually a nice little thing. I, I don't know, it works out nice when it was in person and you could like meet with someone, but um, if you, know anyone else in like the same class and stuff you can even make a game out of it like back when i was a student i used to do that all the time um so you know that game where you do that thing where you like try to slap your friend's hand before they get out, out of the way like what we would do is like um try to see who would get the right substitution first and or else you get a slap or something like that or you just like say okay you have three seconds to tell me what the right thing is and then you show them and then if they get it you they, they don't get a slap. If they do, they get a slap. Or if uh, if they don't get it, they get a slap. Or you just make a game out of it, like who can do the most? Or, or just make a game out of it yourself or something. And yeah, you can you can play little games like that and it'll be, it'll be fun and it'll go by very quickly because you're not actually writing down all the steps. You're just trying to practice the act of identifying what the right substitution would be. Um, in this case, what do you think the right substitution would be? I think it's on you, F1, because uh, Jirong is like, uh, 12 hours off, so I'm not gonna like bother him. To... <laughs> um, so like, I would say the one plus radical X squared part. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a decent guess, uh, but what? I have a question, like we learned yesterday that we could make this like LN absolute value X. So what happens if we like turn the whole denominator into U? and then just substitute this into- if, if, if you ever get to a situation where you end up with that after a substitution, then yes, it becomes ln of absolute value u. That's not going, that's not going to happen here though, because, there, because there's a square here. 
So it looks like it looks to me like what would happen is you'd get a, a one over u squared, which is is not an ln. Um, but yeah, uh, you you'd worry about that rule, the ln of absolute value u rule, after you do the substitution. Right now, you just want to get to a simpler place, which yeah, u equals one plus uh, radical x. Looks like a good idea. Du would be one over two rad x. Which means if I solve for my dx, that's two rad x du. And I can go plug this in. So this is one over the rad x I didn't do anything with. This guy becomes u squared. My dx is now two rad x du. The rad x is cancel. And so the two I can factor out. So this is one over that. How do you deal with one over u squared? Is it just u negative two? Squared? Right, you'd, re you'd rewrite it as u to the minus two. Um, by the way, this is uh, not ln of u squared. Common mistake, common error. A lot of students just think that, oh, because it's one over, it goes to ln. It, that's not true. You only get any ln if you have one over a linear function. After you do a substitution, you have to have a linear function in the denominator. That gives you ln. Um, if there's a quadratic in the denominator, it's not an ln. You're going to have to uh, rewrite it. So now, yeah, you add 1 to the power, which is u to the minus 1, divide by the new power. Yeah, so it's one plus rad x to the minus one plus c. Okay. Um, you here, I think it's, um, I think, I think we're actually getting it. So u here would be like the three plus x squared. Your du would be two uh, x dx. So eh? then uh, your dx would be du over two x. So you'd plug that in. So you'd have x over the cube root of u times du over two x. The x's would cancel. You can factor out the one half. And the one over the cube root of u is u to the minus one third. You add one to the power, divide by the new power, plus c. So this is three u to the two thirds plus c. Or three times three plus x squared. And so that is, uh, that's the answer there. Um, as for a comparison here, I could have let uh, something like u cubed equals three plus x squared. Then I would have three u squared du equals two x dx. So then I had three over two u squared du equals x dx. Then the new integral would become, my x dx would be three over two u squared du. In the denominator, I would just have u because the cube kills the cube root. So then I would just have three over two times the integral of u du, which is three over four u squared. Yeah, so 
I actually made a mistake here. This should be three over four. Because the one half, right? So this is uh, three over four. I think I canceled the twos in my head instead of like multiplying them. And so this would give you uh, three over four times the one plus X. It was three plus X squared cube root. So it's three plus X squared times the cube root, which is the one third power. Right. And that would be an alternative. Um, notice that here, it's just, it's a lot nicer round numbers, whereas here I have to deal with like minus one third and blah, blah, blah. Um, just thought I'd mention that. It's not something that's terribly important. Um, um, any idea for you for this one? The cosine cubed. So u equals cosine cubed. Du would be what? Would it be cosine four over four? No, you're do you you're finding derivative. I'm not sure how to find the derivative of cosine cubed. It's cosine cubed. Oh, so is it like two cosine squared? It's three cosine squared. times minus sign, right? You have to do the, uh, that guy. Now you see this here, um, blah, 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 dx. How would you actually swap that out? Right, you, like you won't have, it's not gonna work, right? So um, it's a good guess, but clearly it's not quite what you want, because how are you going to be able to swap that thing out with anything? Like if you were to swap out a cosine squared and a sine, you're going to be left over with a cosine. Well, I guess you could do u to the one third being the cosine, but I think this is just more trouble than it's worth. Um, Too complicated. I think realizing that the cosine cubed really just means cosine all cubed is nicer. Um, a better a better way to do it would just to be the cosine. So your du would be the minus sine of x. And so if you solve for dx, you just get minus uh, du over sine of x. That would that would be nicer because now when you plug it in, you get u cubed, and here you have minus d u cubed. You have the sine of x. Then you have minus du over sine of x. This guy would cancel. This guy gives you minus the integral of u cubed du. u to the four over four plus c. And you're going to have uh, u was u as cosine. So that's not, so with uh, trig functions, you can always substitute the inside, right? The same way like how here, when you had the cube root, you substitute the inside. What's inside the cube root? Um, for like a cosine cube, you can substitute the inside and that will give you the uh, correct thing.
Now, the trick for this one is not a substitution, right? If you did uh, u equals, say, the sine of x, your du would be uh, cosine of x dx. And then what do you do with the, that, right? Or u equals the sine squared, it's not going to be better. Your du would be 2 sine x cosine x. What do you do with that? Um, we did a guy like this yesterday, I think. We did cosine squared. Um, and so uh, the trick for the integral of sine squared is uh, the uh, double angle formula. for cosine. Uh, so we know that from the double angle form for cosine, cosine squared can be written as one half, one plus cosine two X and sine squared can be written as one half, one minus cosine two X. And so um, the integral of sine squared DX is going to be one half times integral of one minus cosine two X. Now to deal with that, um, there are a couple ways you could deal with this. Um, notice that this here is going to be one half times X and it's going to be one half sine of uh, 2x. Where to actually obtain this as the answer, you had to do a substitution u equals 2x. Um, but there's a shortcut here that I'm going to do. Um, so we know that the integral of 1 is x, no problem. What about the cosine of 2x? The thing is, you don't really have a basic rule for that yet. What you could do Oh, is let u equals the two x. Your du would be two dx. This means your dx would be du over two. This means you'd go back and you'd plug it in. You'd have cosine of u times du over two. So one half would come out. The integral of that is going to be your sine. And then you back substitute get sine of 2x. And that is what you put here. But um, it turns out, uh, there is a, a shortcut um, that can apply here. And you can even do this a little bit more generally, um, or um, you can do this wherever you would have like a linear of, or wherever uh, your derivative of of your substitution would be a constant. Uh, so, i.e., if you have, say, the integral of something like f of, and inside that you have a linear thing plugged in, like mx plus b, then this would be one over m times the integral of this, if you did that. 
if you did like a u equals mx plus b. And so, um, so by applying the above, we can simply take the integral of the outer function then divide uh, by the derivative. We can only do this if the derivative is a constant. Do not try to do this in general. It is. It will not work. Um, so what does that mean? So for example, what I mean is the integral of sine of say mx plus b is going to be minus one over m cosine of mx plus b. Right, just integrate the outer function, divide by the derivative. Uh, because the derivative is a constant, just dividing by the constant uh, will actually give you that rule. And you can actually just skip it. Uh, so you don't need a substitution. If you have the cosine of something that looks like this, then the derivative is just going to be one over m sine of mx plus b. So, um, another example, if I had the integral of the cosine of 7x plus 12 dx, technically you do a substitution, u equals 7x plus 12, blah, 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 you'll go through the motions, but the thing is you're going to end up somewhere where you kind of know where you're gonna end up anyway. Just divide by the constant, by, divide by the derivative and take the derivative of the outer function. That's where the answer is going to be. And so you can skip all these like steps here because it's not going to, it's not gonna change anything. Same thing as if I had say, um, the integral of say, if e to the uh, 5x plus 14. Just take the integral of the outer function, which you know is gonna be 5x plus 14, and then divide by the derivative of the, the thing that you would have substituted. So if this was going to be your u, this would be your u prime. Um, it does not work, so this is a non-example, if I say e to the x squared dx, it's actually not just me dividing by the derivative of that and putting the original function. That's not true. This, this can only be done if your derivative is a constant. You can apply this little trick. And it kind of, it saves you a few lines of writing stuff down. Um, yeah. So here's a definite integral one. Um, so we have, uh, now, this is a definite integral. So like I said here, you have a couple options. So Thank you. 
and uh, let's say let's call it method one. Uh, leave the old limits or method two change the limits. This method avoids back substitution. That's what I was mentioning earlier. There are times when if you have a definite integral, you can skip step four where you do the back substitution. And there are times when this can actually save you a lot of trouble. Um, there isn't really anything in Calc 1 where it's going to save you a lot of time, so it's completely optional at this stage. But there are, there are situations in Calc 2 where it's like to do the back substitution by itself is uh, really annoying. And so you would actually opt for method 2 as opposed to method 1. Um, so um, I would say it's optional in... Calc one, but highly recommended for some situations in Calc two and above, say for Trig substitution. Um, so let me actually do this in two ways. Uh, so we have uh, the integral from one up to E of ln of the radical of X all over X dx. And let me do method one. So first of all, I can notice that this is just one half ln of x all over x, right? Because I can apply a log rule. So second, uh, I'm going to realize that, hey, this is uh, kind of difficult. I'm going to do a substitution. Um, what I would substitute here is my u. Uh, my ln of x would be the u. So I would go u equals ln of x. My du would be that one over x dx. And so my dx would be x du. I would go and I would plug it in. So my u is ln of x. My x is the same. Here I have x du. This would cancel, this would cancel. What I want you to notice now is that I'm not going to change the limits. I'm going to leave the old limits. However, I'm going to indicate that the limits that are left are in terms of the variable x. So notice here, I'm going to write x equals one up to e. So here I leave the old limits. But indicate that they apply to x because you don't want to plug them into the u because they're not the values of u, they're values of x's. Do not want to make a mistake. Of plugging them into u. So because your limits are left as the old limits, they're left in terms of X's, it means once you're going to do the plug-in part, you have to first convert everything back to X's so that you can plug in the one and the E into the X. The thing is, um, that means you have to do the back substitution. Uh, and so that's, that's what we're going to do. So, um, so what I would have here is the integral from X equals one up to E of u du. Uh, we know the fundamental theorem of calculus tells us how to deal with that.
So this is going to be u squared over two, and I'm going to write x equals one. Right? Again, just to remind myself that it's x, I'm plugging into x. Right? So now I have one fourth u squared x equals one up to e. Um, to plug in the limits, and apply the fundamental theorem of calculus, we must back substitute. So before I can plug in the one and the E, I'm going to have to change that U back to ln of X. Now I can do the plug-in. Fundamental theorem of calculus says first plug in the top number minus plug in the bottom number. Uh, log of one is zero. Uh, log of E is one. So this just leaves us with a quarter as the answer. So that's method one where we don't change the limits, but we do have to indicate that what variable the limit is supposed to be in, right? So you have to do that. But other than that, everything is kind of straightforward. You go through, you apply the fundamental theorem of calculus, just make sure that you're applying it to the right variable. Um, method two is you can avoid the back substitution. Um, So let's say I had the integral from one up to E of ln of the radical of X all over X dx. First, I could realize that, okay, that's one half ln of X over X dx. Now I'm going to do my U equals ln X, my DU equals one over X dx. So then my DX is equal to X du. Nothing else changes there, however, I can apply an additional operation where I was like, uh, change the limits. So here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change limits. What you do is you use the substitution equation. That's how you're going to change them. So u is equal to ln x. So that's how we're going to change from u to x. So now I know when x equals one, which is the lower limit, that means my u is going to be ln of one, which is zero. And when my x equals e, my u is going to be ln of e, which is one, right? So I use the substitution equation to change it. I plug in X into that equation and solve for the U. And what you'd realize now is that I've converted one to zero and E to one. And so this would become zero to one of the U over X DU. Or the x's would cancel. Okay. So now the limits are no longer one and e. Uh, notice that these limits now apply to these limits now apply to you, there is no need to switch back to X. So 
So we avoid uh, the back substitution. Like I don't need to back substitute to get back to the X because I change the numbers to work with you. So now I can uh, do my, I uh, think I forgot to have. So I can just do the integral, which is just going to be the power rule, u squared over two between zero and one. So that's u squared over four between zero and one. I can plug in the one minus plug in the zero. And again, I get the answer one fourth. Okay. There are two methods here, one where I change the limits and one where I don't. And in calc one, it's not going to be a big deal. Uh, changing the limits pretty much just saves me time in these two lines right here. Um, but um, I, I didn't have to do it at this point. So in Calc 1, it's not a big deal. Uh, you can change the limits if you want. Uh, either way, I don't, it's not going to make much of a difference. In Calc 2, though, it can make a world of difference um, and save you a lot of work because there are some methods of integration where the back substitution is not so easy as, oh, I use this, you was this, let me just swap it back in. Like it's not gonna be that easy. Um, yeah, so that's how you can avoid uh, back substitution whenever you have a definite integral. Um, if you don't, if you have an indefinite integral, then you just would do you, you would do the back substitution. You always want to give your answer in terms of the original variable. Um, okay, let's finish the other guys up. So we know that, um, So here, the thing that makes this complicated is the thing in the exponential. Um, so I'm going to make u equals the arc tangent. You might also think that the one over one plus x squared, the one plus x squared to the minus one is complicated. But if you took that as your derivative, as your u, you found the derivative, it actually wouldn't help you that much because you'd still have an e to the arc tangent. Like how do you deal with that? It's a complicated function. E to the x, easiest function in the world to deal with um, because whether you're taking integral or derivative, you don't really do anything. Um, so the fact that there's an arc tangent in the exponential is the problem. So I would try to get rid of that. Um, your du is of course one over one plus x squared, which means if I solve for my dx, get that. So now I can plug in. So I have that one plus X squared to the minus one E to the U and my DX would become uh, one plus X squared DU. This would cancel that. And so I have the integral of E to the U DU. The integral of that is just E to the U. So this is e to the arc ten. And that's that one.
Um, yeah. But substitution, this is, we've essentially done all the principles. You're essentially going to just try to replace something that's complicated. Um, this one is actually very interesting though. Um, but the trick here is to think of the X that you see in terms of a radical X, because then the derivative would be one over uh, two radical X. So the radical X in the denominator, you tend to want to have a substitution of radical X to get rid of that. And so that's probably where I would realize. Um, So I would notice that this is actually what I have. And so um, I would say uh, u equals radical x. My du is going to give me one over two rad x. That's going to allow me to get rid of that rad x in the denominator. So this might, means that my dx is two rad x du. I would go in and plug this in. So the three is in the top, didn't do anything with it. The radical X is here. And I would leave that one and replace this one. And then the two rad X uh, du would allow me to get rid of that. Gives me six times the integral of one over one plus u squared du. Uh, we know the integral of one over one plus u squared. It's a basic rule. Uh, that's arc tangent. So this is just the arc tangent of the square root of x. And that's, that's that one. Tangent and secant. Hopefully you remember that the derivative of tangent is secant squared. So that kind of tells you that you want the u to be your tangent. So then you just have u du, because this, this is literally here, your du. And this is u. So it's u squared over two plus c, so that's 10 squared x all over two plus c. Uh, to do this one, u equals one plus x squared, your du is equal to two x dx. Since your dx is going to be du over two x, I would also make a note here that x squared is going to be u minus one. Um, I could have done this another way, which is probably how I would do it, but I just want to do a regular substitution with u first. Um, but yeah, I'm going to plug this in. I have x cubed, I have the radical of u here. My dx is going to be du over two x. My x is going to cancel into this, leaving a squared behind. So that's going to leave me with x squared one half over the radical of u du. And that's where this guy is going to come in handy.
And this actually looks very similar to an example we had yesterday. Um, you would just rewrite this as u to the one half minus u to the minus one half. Add one to the power, divide by the new power. Add one to the power, divide by the new power plus c. And u was one plus x squared. You can have is one third, one plus x squared to the three halves. That's one plus x squared to the one half. or here, what I could do is um, probably how I would want to do it, u squared is equal to one plus x squared. So I can get rid of that radical in the denominator because then that's gonna save me a lot of work later on. This of course would mean that my x squared is going to be equal to um, u squared minus one, right? And I notice that this is going to be equal to, of course, x squared times x. So now I have 2u du equals 2x dx, which means that u du equals x dx, which means that this part here is u du. And this part here is actually u squared minus one. And then this part here is actually just u. So substituting this in, I would have u squared minus one over u times u du. The u's would cancel. And I would just have the integral of u squared minus one du. Um, and you can compare that to like this and you already see how much nicer it is to actually just get rid of the radical in all one shot. So at this point, apply the power rule u cubed, u cubed over three minus u plus c, and then you plug in your u which is the square root of one plus x squared. So you'd have one plus x squared to the one half power and you cube it. Minus one plus x squared to the one half power. You realize that that's the answer we got last time. So this is one where you can already see the benefits of doing not just a straight up u substitution, but like a u squared substitution or u cube substitution. Uh, this one I we kind of already did. It's just minus one half cosine two x dx. Um, using an earlier trick. I don't know, um, right? Because your u would be this and your du would be a constant. So you just divide by the constant, find the integral of the 
outside outer function. And uh, here is the Um, the last integral here, which is a little bit more interesting than the last one. For this, uh, the trick is to just uh, recognize a, a trig identity. So, sine of 2x is 2 sine x cosine x. So this is really just two times integral of cosine squared x times sine x. And of course here, you can do a substitution. U equals cosine, your d equals minus sine. This means your dx is equal to minus du over sine of x. So you plug that in u equals cosine, you have your sine of x hanging out, you have your dx being this, sines would cancel. So you would have minus two times the integral of u squared du, two u cubed over three plus c. And you have that. Okay, yeah. So I think that was it. So it's a bunch of examples for integration by substitution with, with a bunch of alternatives. Yeah. Um, the last thing is, um, The application, right? So so the main one, other than the physics of motion. Is uh, finding areas between curves. And um, the idea here is uh, consider F and G on A, B with F greater than or equal to G on A, B. All right, so suppose I have a function here, boom, it's my f. Another function here, boom, it's my g. And the goal is I want to find the area in between these functions on a, b. So I have this area here that I care about. And the idea is to use what we know about how integrals work and what they actually compute to be able to figure this out. So copy. Paste. 
next. Okay, so what you're going to recognize here is that the area that I care about is going to be equal to, what we can do is we can actually compute the area under the upper function. So let's say the area under F. So that's going to be the integral from A to B of F of X dx, and then we can compute the area under g. That's going to be the integral from a to b of g of x dx. And then what you can do is realize that you can subtract these two. So to get the green area, all I have to do is take the blue area and then subtract the red area, which is under here. And so that kind of gives you the idea. So then your area ends up being the integral from a to b of f of x dx minus the integral from a to b of g of x dx, which ends up being the integral from a to b of f of x minus g of x dx. Right, and so as a concept, uh, what you're pretty much doing is that, uh, that is, um, if A equals the area between curves on A, B, where one is greater than or equal to the other, on a b, uh, then your a is going to be equal to the integral of the top function minus the bottom function. And so that's, uh, that's the main concept. Um, yeah, so uh, example. Find the area between bounded by the curves. y equals x squared and y equals the square root of x. And um, you can say include a sketch in your answer. So I mean, for this, I am going to ask you a problem like this, just for FYI. And it's just, it's it's not anything that's going to be uh, difficult. It's just a matter of you figuring out who's on top, who's on bottom, and then doing the integration. So, um, 
one way you can do that is to actually sketch it. So you can actually sketch your x squared. It should be symmetric somewhat. This is y equals x squared. You can sketch your radical x, which would look like that. Y equals the square root of x. And so the required area would be this. That's the area between the curves. Um, shade Z. So it's that. So now, of course, what you want to do is here, they didn't tell you A, B, but if they don't, what you do is you just like use your intersection points to describe it. So you'd want to find where this is. So you can find the intersections, which here it should be obvious that it's zero and one, but um, if you don't know, you can actually just set the uh, equations equal to each other. We could say square both sides. Factor out an X. So you get X equals zero or X equals one. And so you have that. And so this is what's going to tell you that this is one and that is zero. Although for these, I mean, it probably should be obvious. And then you can just say, oh, the area we want is just going to be the integral from zero to one of top minus bottom. And so now, um, the top is going to be the radical. I know that this is the top here. It's the bottom here of the shaded region. It's going to be radical x minus x squared. And so the actual integration on a problem like this is going to be, it's not going to be hard. Um, it's usually going to be something basic like a power rule or something like that. Um, so you add one to the power, divide by the new power, add one to the power, divide by the new power between zero and one. So you get two thirds minus one third. So you get the answer is a third. And yeah, that's the application. But error between curves is very nice because it's actually gives us the full solution to the area problem. So remember for the area problem, we had this whole blob, but we only look at the top part because we wanted to look at this as a function. So we had to pass the vertical line test, but then you might say, well, what about the bottom part, right? Well, now this allows us to put in the bottom part as a, sec as a second function. And we can find the error of the entire thing by finding the integral of the top part minus the bottom part. And yeah. Um, one thing it, it should be noted, uh, the top function and bottom function may switch roles. So that can happen and um, just know that it can happen and uh, figure out what to do afterwards. So for example, just to give you a diagrammatic example, let's say you have one function that looks like uh, this 
So let's say that's your f of x. And then you have another function that looks like this. That's your g of x. And let's say the area that you care about is this. And let's suppose that this is A, this is C is the intermediary point. Then notice that on A to C, our F is the top function, but on C to B, our F is the bottom function. So it can actually switch roles. Then this means that your area would be equal to the integral from A to C of F of X minus G of X plus you go from C to B of the other way around. Because the top and bottom switches and that's how you'd find the area. So you would just, just break it up. Um, So that's it. Um, I actually did want to talk to you about a couple more applications, but this is by far the main one. Um, so I will do that tomorrow. But as far as the final is concerned, I just expect you to know up to error between curves. So, um, And that the applications they won't take the whole time, so I'm I'm just going to move ahead and teach you a, a new integration technique. But you'll see it again in Calc two. But it's it's uh, it's really cool, I think. So I also want to cover. Um, Maybe average value of a function would be a nice thing to know as a Calc 1 student, as well as displacement versus uh, distance traveled. There's some nuance there. And I think I want to talk about that. We already did like a distance traveled example to motivate uh, why integration, uh, the connection between integrals and derivatives when finding areas. But uh, there is some nuance that I want to talk about. But that being said, uh, we'll stop there. But uh, up until this point is what you're responsible for on the final. So everything up to computing integrals, including using substitution and finding errors between curves. So we will stop there and Yeah, there's nothing else. There's nothing else really to say at this point. Um, so yeah, thank you for your time and attention. <laughs> uh, let's actually get out of here. Um, have a good night. Good luck. And I guess I'll see you guys uh, in the next one tomorrow. <laughs>